But once David enters the story, which is about halfway through the book of 1 Samuel, it's 1 Samuel 16, then we begin to, see, begin to see clearly negative assessments of Saul, perhaps because the sources about David stem from circles that were loyal to the house of David, and David is going to succeed Saul, obviously, as the second king of Israel. Perhaps the negative assessment is because of Saul's, Saul's ultimate failure and suicide, and that had to be accounted for by identifying some fatal flaw in him. So now his ecstatic prophecies are presented as irrational fits of mad behavior. So where once the Spirit of the Lord was said to come upon him, now he's said to be seized by an evil spirit from the Lord that rushes upon him suddenly, causing him to rave in his house. Uh, elsewhere, he commits errors. He doesn't obey Samuel's instructions to the letter, and that's going to cost him the support of Samuel and ultimately God. We have two stories of disobedience related in 1 Samuel. One is in chapter 13. He sees that the morale of his men is sagging, and so to sort of rally them together, he officiates at a sacrifice. He was supposed to wait for Samuel to arrive and do it, but he, he sees that it needs to happen now, and so he officiates at the sacrifice himself. And this appropriation of a priestly function enrages Samuel. And this is Samuel's first pronouncement or prediction that God will not establish Saul's dynasty over Israel, despite the fact, by the way, that other kings at other times will sacrifice with impunity. So it's, it's interesting because David and others will sacrifice and, and doesn't seem to be a problem. But here it's given as the occasion for Samuel's fury and his first pronouncement that the dynasty of Saul will not be established. In chapter 15, we have a second instance of disobedience that earns Samuel's disapproval. Again, against Samuel's order, he spares the life of an enemy king. This is King Agag. He spares his life and otherwise violates the terms of harem, you know, this notion of total destruction or devotion of booty and enemies to God through total destruction. And again, when he violates the, the order of harem, Samuel again announces that God regrets having made Saul king. The Lord has this day torn the kingship over Israel away from you and has given it to another who is worthier than you. That's chapter 15, verse 28. In any event, with his support eroding, Saul seems to sink into a deep depression and paranoia. And toward the end of his life, he's depicted as being completely obsessed with David and the threat that David poses to Saul himself, but also his dynasty. Saul is angry that his own son, Jonathan, who presumably should succeed him to the throne, has a deep friendship with David and, in fact, throws his support over to David instead of himself. In, in several jealous rages, Saul attempts to kill David or to have him and his supporters killed. Uh, one particularly violent incident, he kills 85 priests who he believes have given shelter to David and his supporters. So in these encounters, Right? between Saul and David. The sources portray Saul as this, this raving, obsessed, paranoid person, and David is seen as a sort of innocent victim, and he protests his loyalty and his support for Saul. He doesn't seem to understand why Saul should view him as a threat. And twice he passes up the opportunity to do away with Saul himself. He says, I will not raise my hand against the Lord's anointed. So the portrayal of Saul as a raving and paranoid man who's obsessed with David probably reflects the views of later writers who were apologists for the house of David.